years, what we've done with the Center on Rights Development is not only we have moved into a thematic sensibility mode, but in fact we have adopted one of the three documents of the International Bill of Rights. The one that is least known, the least reported on, least understood, some say because it's the most vague, and it's the ICESCR, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. That's right. I always get the ICCPR and ICC, ICESCR mixed up. And so what we have to do is every year we look within that document and find themes. There's no shortage of themes, and then focus in on that theme. So in past years, we have looked at the right to education, the right to water, uh, and issues of that nature. And this year, we decided to focus on uh, the right to health. And uh, yeah. so before I go any further, I'd like to first thank the incredible amounts of work that the CORD uh, staff has put in hundreds of hours to make this symposium possible. Uh, it is also uh, delighted that the Global Health Affairs Program and the Humanitarian Assistance Program uh, are our partners along with the Middle East Center. So it's a, a wonderful cooperative venture to be able to do these kinds of things and to pull them off and to make sure that not only are we doing something that is a benefit to the core Bell community, but we hope to the larger DU Colorado community. And that way also to bring uh, both uh, our uh, internationally renowned speakers here uh, to meet all of you, but for you to, of course, to then, for them, uh, to you to meet them and to have this kind of dialogue that is so really important. Um, I hope that you will join us over the next few days through Saturday. Tomorrow we have a full day. You can, I won't go into the details of it. I hope you picked up uh, the, the schedule starting at uh, our next session at noon tomorrow. And this is actually, I have to say, of all the swag that we have put out or actually have received, this is unique, right? That you have now the Center of Rights Development, you have band-aids and uh, all sorts of goodies to keep you a little bit healthier. I also noticed that I, uh, this person still here. I know we must be doing something on health because I saw somebody walk in with their scrubs on. Who is that person who's still wearing? Oh, sorry. Oh, no, see, no, no. I, I know that means we're legitimate. Now, if, if people still, you know, anytime you're doing something on dealing with health and medicine, and there's somebody in scrubs, you know, you've reached the right audience, obviously. Uh, um, on, on that. So, uh, when we decided to focus on the attention not just on the right to health, uh, but specifically what we do is in the Spring Symposium sort of narrow the focus a little bit within that particular thematic uh, idea, we decided com on complex care, the right to health in emergency settings. The very first person on my list that made sense to me was to have uh, my dear friend and colleague Dr. Chiara Lapora come back and rejoin us as the keynote speaker. That made that was the that first person on our list, and then we uh, it was uh, immediately seconded by my colleagues Ken and and, uh, uh, and Randall and others, uh, and, and directors of their individual programs. So there was a unanimous choice. I think not. I think I know here. Um, so I'm delighted to have her back. She's trained as a medical practitioner at the Universities of Pavia and Lisbon and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Dr. Chiara Lapora has worked with Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, Doctors Without Borders, as you probably know it, MSF, in various capacities across Africa and the Middle East. An interactive tutorial that she wrote underpins the e-learning software used by the World Health Organization and the UN High Commissioner for Refugees for Clinical Management of Rape and Humanitarian Emergencies. After a 2008-2010 mid-career fellowship in bioethics at the National Institute of Health, Dr. Lepore taught global health affairs and served as the director of the Humanitarian Assistance Program here at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies for a year before returning to MSF. Dr. Lepore is the co-author with Robert Goodwin of the critically acclaimed book entitled On Complicity, Complicity, excuse me, Complicity, I'm still not doing it right, am I? Uh, and Compromise, published in 2013 last year by Oxford University Press. Her seminal article, The Tortured Patient, A Medical Dilemma is Required Reading in my course, the core course on forced labor, uh, human trafficking, and in torture. She currently works with MSF as a program manager and is responsible for operations across the Middle East. 
Uh, and it is, so we're glad that she was able to break away from that obviously critical, ongoing critical time in her schedule to be able to spend a couple of days with us. One of the aspects I really admire most about Kiara is that she thinks. She really thinks about the work that she does. Its effectiveness, its presumed moral certainty, her own role in trying to effectuate change, and her willingness to see the world around her neither with a jaundiced view nor with rose-colored glasses, but just as it really is. It is my very real pleasure to introduce you to our opening keynote speaker, Dr. Chiara Lepore. Thank you for uh, being here, to all of you, and uh, to the organizer of this symposium. Um, I am going to try to talk about uh, the right to care in emergency settings. And to be honest, when I started thinking about this theme, I realized that it is really something that I didn't know much about. Um, I've been working in the field since 2002, and I've been working mainly in emergency settings, um, and definitely working uh, to somewhat create access to care in situations where people have no access. And at the same time, it was very difficult to put that in relation with the concept of the right uh, to help. Because in a way, the situations where I've been working didn't show that people had, had that right. So the way in which I'm going to present it is somewhat, not as something that exists, but mainly as something that we should construct, we should work for. Um, and so I'm going to talk, talk mainly about the making of uh, the right to, to care and to help. There it works. I have to start with a couple of disclaimer. The first one is that, um, of course, in emergency setting there are today a variety of actors. Um, there are local actors to start with, there are uh, United Nations, there are military actors. I am just going to focus mainly on humanitarian actors, partially because that's what I know best. Um, and I think partially because the type of questions that we ask ourselves are a bit different. And um, of course, emergency setting includes both natural disaster and man-made disaster, I will talk mainly about conflict. Not because there is no problem of access to care in disaster, of course there are. But in a way, um, again, this is something that I know better, and I think that the questions that are posed in conflict situation are somewhat a little bit more complicated, whereas in disaster, there are a lot of practical questions, but um, yeah, it just needs to be done in a way. The second disclaimer, and this I'm really sorry, uh, I'm just putting it out there. I am not going to talk about Syria at all. Um, of course, we know it's going to be like a, the elephant in the room, but um, you probably know that MSF had a lot of uh, workers, expatriate and national staff working inside Syria, um, notably in, uh, in areas that were not controlled by the government. Today we are facing a very complicated security situation, and so MSF uh, had to declare a complete blackout of communication. So I will not mention it, and sorry about that, but I can't do it again. Um, and of course the last disclaimer is what I'm saying is my own opinion. It doesn't necessarily represent uh, the opinions, the position or policy of uh, MSF and uh, the position or policy of the National Institutes of Health where I did uh, a big part of my research. So what I'm trying to do is I will speak for around, let's say, less than one hour. Um, and during this time, please feel free to interrupt me, uh, especially if what I'm saying is not clear, either because it's not a clear concept, either because my English is not good, Feel free really to interrupt me while I speak. 
And then uh, I will leave anyway a big part of the time just for the discussion so that um, we can talk about things rather than having just a, a speech. Um, so the idea of, uh, I'm just giving you a sort of brief uh, uh, preview of, uh, of the talk. I'm really going to start by talking about the right to access medical care and how uh, crisis somewhat implies a breakdown of those rights. Um, and so entering into the discussion of the making of those rights and whose job is it and how is that job done. So really going to present you somewhat of a behind the scene perspective uh, on how we try to work to construct uh, the right for patients to access care. And I want to end with a question and really try to have as much as we can uh, a discussion in terms of the right to actually provide care and whether the right to care, the right to receive care somewhat uh, implies the fact that somebody else has that right and if that right exists, you know, under which condition. But that's really going to be a part of the discussion. Um, well, I'm not going to read you the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but this is just to point out that, of course, the right to access health care exists both in any normal situation, exists in disaster, and of course exists in a war situation under somewhat of a, of a smaller type of definition, um, a little less ambitious maybe, but the international humanitarian law is very clear, the wounded and sick shall be collected and cared for, and just as a reminder, the wounded and sick include anyone, whether they are civilians or fighters. In the moment where somebody gets to be wounded, they are just wounded. Uh, there's no more status uh, attached to people. And together with this, let me just give you a little story to set the scene. Um, that doesn't speak necessarily specifically about, about it, but I think it's just to give you an idea of the type of settings where, uh, where we work normally and how those rights are um, somewhat at odds with the situation. So you know, MSF has, and as much as a lot of other organizations, has somewhat of an obsession against weapons. And we really need to make sure that all the areas where we work ambulances, the houses and everything are weapon free. So there are no weapons uh, signals all over, etc. This is really challenging uh, in situations where people are used to carry out, carry on weapons all over. And it's really challenging, particularly for instance in a hospital, because everyone arrives and there's always a big discussion to convince them to leave their weapons at the door. So what we do is at the gate, we usually set up some sort of uh, area, uh, exactly like the ones that you have in restaurants here, where people can give in their uh, Kalashnikov, get a token instead, <laughs> and enter, and then they will find their Kalashnikov back. This doesn't always work, because people mm -hmm. take, like, anyway, cares a lot about their weapons, so they don't necessarily want a token, they prefer to keep it. There are a lot of discussions about that at the, at the end. So in one of the hospitals in the south of Yemen, I had a discussion with the security guards because they had a lot of difficulties with people coming in, and there were a lot of fights uh, actually happening for that. So I observed a little bit how it happened, and I noticed that um, all, the, all the weapons, different types of weapons, of course, uh, they were put on, on the ground. So I had a, a long discussion with them saying, look, people really care about their weapons. They spent a lot of money about that, uh, in, in those. So maybe what we need to do is to construct a nice cupboard where people can see that we take care of the weapons once we take it. So we can put the Kalashnikov on one side, we can put the knives on the other, and the pistol on the other. And to be honest, I was a bit proud of my idea because I thought I was being very open to the concept of people carrying weapons. Um, and so I said all that, and, and the security guards were very happy, and they said, yeah, that's a very good idea. So what should we do with the bombs? 
we decided not to take the bombs, just to let you know. But again, this is just to give you an idea of the type of situation where we are. Uh, we are actually carrying weapons is considered a higher right than having access to care in and of itself. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, the Central African Republic, I'm sure you all know that there's, uh, it's, a, it's one of those countries that has been in a really long-term crisis and now is in a crisis within the crisis. So there has been an enormous amount of displaced people, um, an enormous amount of forced uh, evacuation and um, a lot of killings and wounded people. So that's one of the situations um, where I can show you part of the Muslim population that left Bangui because of the persecution that they were being exposed to and got to Karno, which is one of the cities where, uh, where we have a hospital. And they got into the church and they were um, welcoming the church to get some level of, uh, of protection. And then Karno was attacked by the same uh, anti balakas people that were against them in Bangui. So they are now under siege within the church. The church is 120 meters from the hospital and they cannot access the hospital. Um, MSF has the advantage of having negotiated the possibility of sending ambulances and yet a lot of these people, because of what they suffered before, they would not feel comfortable enough in actually taking the, one, the, the ambulance for 120 meters. <coughs> this is one example. The second one is Fallujah Hospital. Uh, this February, you all know what's going on in Ambar region in Iraq. Those are the pictures of the hospital. As you can see, it really has been targeted. Uh, so one of the problems that we have been facing quite a lot in the majority of the Middle Eastern countries where we work is specific targeting of healthcare structures and healthcare providers. This happened in Syria, it happened in Libya, it happens, it happens a lot in Iraq. That's the emergency room that you see there with all the, um, that has been shot at. Unfortunately, the, the head of the emergency department got, got wounded and a lot of other doctors and nurses with him as well. Uh, this is a mortar that fell just inside. One of the tragic aspects about this is that so, the, the people in the hospital, when they started seeing that the hospital was being targeted, decided to move out. And they identified a private hospital that was not far where they could move. And the ISIS militia that were around there, uh, they actually forced them to stay in that, in that hospital, partially because they wanted to have healthcare, they wanted to have the possibility of being treated in case they were getting wounded, and partially also because it was easier to use a hospital as a sort of shield uh, for any type of attack. So those are, again, um, a situation where, of course, it will be very difficult for patients to access, but also the doctors and the providers that are trying to do their job are at uh, an increased okay, risk uh, in providing care. Uh, the next example I would like to show you is uh, Yemen. In uh, Yemen, uh, in December, there was a very deadly attack uh, to a hospital that is attached to the, uh, one of the ministries, but it really is a hospital used by the population. There were uh, 60 dead and a lot of wounded people uh, out of that. I have a video that was taken by the camera inside the hospital. So if you don't mind and you bear looking at it, it's going to be four minutes. Um, there are some really violent scenes, so if anyone don't want to see it, maybe it's better to go out now. Um, but I think it, again, it just shows somewhat of the absurdity of the situations that people are exposed to.
So as you can see, this is the entrance of the hospital, and it's a very normal day, eight in the morning, father and the child are entering, saying hello to the doctor. Oh. And you can see doctors and nurses, a uh, very normal situation and uh, interaction. And then at this point, you start seeing people running. There's, uh, there has been an explosion down there on that side. People are running, but there's a not completely clear situation. And what everyone does is somewhat to enter into the entrance of the hospital, considering that the hospital is somewhat going to protect them. Um, here you see the car of attackers that is coming in. And the second explosion happens now with the car that was a suicide car. And all, all the people, voila. So this is the first bomb that happens at the entrance of the hospital, exactly where all the, those people were trying to uh, get some level of protection. And from now on, you're going to see a lot of scenes like that with cameras that stop working just because of the smoke of all the bombs that are being thrown into the hospital. Those were two patients. patient trying to look for some help. So one of the staggering aspects of a lot of the, of the terroristic attacks that are happening both in Yemen and for instance in Iraq is the fact that there is a clear targeting of anyone who tries to provide some help. So Iraq for instance today has a lot of um, first bombs that explode. Some people get wounded. Sorry. You know, some people get wounded, somebody comes to help them, and then there's a second bomb that has been thought to really target the ones who are there. So here are all the patients waiting uh, and trying again to hide themselves on the corner. Uh, that's one of the attackers coming in. I will stop it here, but I think it got the principal message. And again, this is a major hospital in the capital of a country that is not at war. So the type of situation I'm describing are the type of situation that in books are somewhat described as complex emergencies. <laughs> uh, there are all sorts of definition of what complex emergency is. There is one a situation with complex social, political, and economic origins, which involves the breakdown of state structure, the disputed legitimacy of host authorities, the abuse of human rights, and possibly armed conflict that creates humanitarian needs. I am a bit skeptical about the whole idea of complex emergency, because in my experience, all emergencies are complex. And I see no, no big difference between what we call complex emergency and non complex complex emergency. We know, even if we look at natural disasters, for instance, we know that natural disasters are going to be way more deadly, way more problematic at a lot of levels, um, create way more difficulties in access to care when there is a breakdown of poverty or a breakdown of all those type of complex so social, political, and economic situations. Uh, whereas the same natural disaster happening in a rich country will not have the same consequences. So I'm not going to use very much the idea of complex emergency. Um, I will just call them crises, but you know, like you call them what you want, or it's just semantic. Um, one of the reasons for which I like the idea of crisis is its etymology. So of course it, it describes a, a difficult situation, but the etymology of uh, of the word crisis 
is situations where a decision needs to be made, uh, which I think is something really that talks to the work that we try to do. So, in this complex emergency, during this crisis, in this situation, as you've seen, Iraq, Yemen, and so many others all over the world, um, the reality is rights are just not there. There is no such thing as the right to health. Um, there is no such thing as the right to life to start with. So, in a way, it's a very difficult discourse to talk about the right to health in those, in those uh, contexts. Somewhat in the ordinary processes that we create are the ones that ensures the fact that rights are there and are going to be protected. But the crisis situations are the ones where there are humanitarian actors and emergency workers in general that are somewhat filling in for a situation where there has been a complete breakdown of the ordinary process. And um, the failure of ordinary process includes the breakdown of rights in general. Whose job is it, uh, in a way, to ensure uh, rights? Uh, what I'm arguing is the fact that in a situation where rights are just not there, the job of anyone who is, who is in who is there, who is exposed to that, is somewhat to make it possible, to do as much as, as we can to create a space for those rights and for those ordinary processes to be back, uh, back in place. And so the idea of crisis as a point where a decision needs to be made is uh, the moment where we need to decide that, okay, we cannot use the usual framework, but we are going to work until the, the balance is brought back in place. Um, the humanitarian response has some conditions um, that I'm just going to repeat here because of course there's a lot of disagreements about those. So you, you're going to have mainly my point of view about uh, what the humanitarian response is about and how what are the conditions for which we can call a response humanitarian compared to any other? So the first aspect is to ensure unhindered access to people in danger, the independent evaluation of the needs of these people, uh, the impartial distribution of aid, which doesn't mean equal distribution of, of aid. It means the distribution on, of aid on the basis of the needs and a neutral and independent impact monitor. Um, I would say that these are really the, the core aspects uh, to ensure that healthcare and the right to healthcare uh, is provided even in a situation of crisis following some principles that are the ones uh, defined by medicine, which is uh, somewhat the, the impartiality of providing aid there where the needs are the greatest. How the conditions are, of course, the harsh breakdown of any previous balance, it needs to be provided by independent of political, economic, or ideological agenda actors. And I really think that that somewhat is essential when you look at what needs to be done. And you can think that any type of dependency or affiliation on political, economic, or ideological ground is really going to hinder one of those <coughs> aspects, whether it is who do we treat first or um, who do we consider in danger, for instance. And the third aspect is really the motivation, which is basically a concern for, for others that are exactly like us but are in a harder situation. So, in order to provide those type of care in that way, um, one of the concepts that is a little bit old, but I think it just helps us uh, thinking, is the concept of humanitarian space. And the several thinkers about uh, humanitarian um, philosophy somewhat, they stated the fact that 
those type of conditions, this type of health care can be provided if there is a humanitarian space. Once more, I'm going to talk about humanitarian space, not as something that is out there, but as something that we need to work for. Um, there are a variety of interpretation of what humanitarian space is, uh, whether it's the physical access that international aid agencies have to population in need, the agency's ability to adhere to the core principle of humanitarian action, the nature of the operating environment, and the ability of population to reach needed life-saving assistance and protection. Um, again, it doesn't matter what you use, but just keep in mind there seems to be the need of having a specific space in order to be able to do the job that uh, we aim uh, to be doing. But that space, again, in the, in the context you've just seen, for instance, is not there. So it needs to be constructed. You're not asking questions because everything is clear or because nothing is clear? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'll start off the, on the behind the scene perspective. And I'm just going to use a lot of example uh, of type of situations that we've uh, experienced in the field. And I'm sure that a lot of you probably have been in the field and uh, um, Please feel free to come in and, and give your own examples because I'm pretty sure that we all have quite a lot. So I, I'm going to, talk, to call it somewhat creating humanitarian space and uh, creating humanitarian space as the precondition for creating access to care. How do we do it? Well, the, the means are always the same. Negotiation, uh, we need to ensure competent assistance, we need to have a level of proximity to the population we aim to um, support. We need to make compromises because not everything we want is going to be possible. And then the whole issue of témoignage. So if with all those aspects we don't manage to create what we want, um, MSF in particular, but some other organizations now, uh, somewhat brings in the concept of communication as a, a last resort in case of lack of humanitarian state. Kara, yep. I hear people around me saying, what is témoignage? <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, what is témoignage? The, the technical translation is witnessing, um, but I think it's something a little bit larger than that, and is the idea of um, providing witness to a situation that is unknown and gets to be, um, like, and we get to shed light on it through the fact of being there in proximity, being able to witness it and to bear witness uh, to the international community, for instance. So let me start with negotiations. Uh, one fundamental aspect about negotiation that we face is that we have to really differentiate between the actors that somewhat administer a territory and the actors that do not administer a territory. And this is a very important uh, distinction that today for us is more important than the old distinction between state actors and non-state actors. So I'll give you an example of situations where, for instance, Al-Qaeda went from a situation where they were using the usual terroristic means and guerrilla type of tactics, and then became administrator of the territory. They started putting out the flags, checkpoints, stamps for people coming in and out. And how the level of negotiation we had with them had to completely shift at that moment. Um, because they didn't have the same techniques anymore, they didn't have the same uh, interest anymore. So I'm not going to talk much about state and non-state actors, but rather administrator and non-administrator. Uh, and I'm talking about var various shades of selfishness, because overall when we try to negotiate with fighting partners, it is very rare to simply tell them, you know what, everyone has the right to care. Um, that's not 
really going to help much. And so we try to somewhat uh, get to what they want, what is interesting for them. Um, so for instance, when Al-Qaeda became the administrator, one of the things that we clearly offer them is, if you let us provide health care, the population will like you more. Um, which is true, by the way. And somewhat was a problematic choice, as you can imagine, because it wasn't necessarily a political choice, the fact of having the population liking them more. It was one of the compromises or the aspects that um, was used in negotiation and somewhat we hope that it was not as true as we said. It didn't work, by the way, just to reassure you. Um, one other aspect is to prevent refugee influx. So for instance, I'll give you the example of Jordan today. Uh, Jordan is one of those countries that had refugees coming from all over the region. And of course have a huge interest in not having too many. So when we negotiate with them so that they can give us access to the border, for instance, or give us access to um, just after the border, one of the aspects that they care about is of course the fact that if we work outside of the Jordanian soil, this is a way for them of preventing refugee influx. Um, so again, it's not at all our aim, but it's definitely something that we're going to mention during the negotiation. And the third one, and this is more for the non-administrator, is a really, really basic discourse, for instance, that we have with um, gangster or criminal type of, of groups that have no interest whatsoever in defending a territory or administering a territory. In that case, basically what we offer is you are going to be wounded at some point and we will be able to treat you as much as we treat anyone else. Sometimes it doesn't work, even like that. So one of the things that we uh, use quite a lot when the actors we try to negotiate with are somewhat the ideological 